Hi, everyone. Welcome to the March 2024 edition of Archaeology News. I'm your host, Rachel, and I invite you to join me on a journey through time as we explore the latest discoveries from the world of archaeology that are helping us piece together the puzzle of humanity's heritage. I have taken my years of experience studying and working in archaeology to spend hours carefully researching, filming, and editing this video so that you can have well-sourced and interesting, accurate news about the past to show you how history is being rewritten all the time. This month's features include the earliest evidence of body perforation slash piercing from a site in Turkey, an exclusive interview with Alexa Hancock about the discovery of the richest ever burial at the El Cano site in Panama, plus new details from a medieval horse cemetery in London that have revealed the international scale of horse trading, which has been likened to the modern economy of supercars. Stay tuned to find out more as I delve into the past, bringing you this in-depth analysis and captivating stories from the archaeological world. Before we begin, don't forget to take a few seconds to subscribe or like this video to help support me in keeping the channel going and showing the algorithm that people are interested in real archaeology, not pseudoscience. If you want to take it further and actively support Inside Archaeology in our efforts to push back against sensationalism and conspiracy theories, all super thanks or Kofi donations go back to into improving and promoting the channel. You can find links to Kofi and my Redbubble store as well, where you can buy archaeology merch in the description of this video. Okay, everyone, let's dig in. We have seven stories this month in our top discovery segment which I will cover in chronological order, starting from those that go the farthest back in time and then working my way up closer to modern day. We begin with evidence from Ethiopia, which shows how Middle Stone Age humans survived in the wake of the eruption of Toba, one of the largest supervolcanoes in history some 74,000 years ago. A new study published in Nature reports on the findings from the Shinfa Matema 1 site, located in the lowlands of northwest Ethiopia near the Shinfa River, which is a tributary of the Blue Nile. They found evidence that this site was occupied during a period when the devastating Toba supervolcano erupted. Tiny fragments of volcanic glass from the site, which matched the chemical signature of the eruption, demonstrated that humans were occupying the site before and after the volcano erupted, more than 4,000 miles away. These microscopic shards of volcanic glass, which were often less than the width of a human hair, can be used to precisely date and correlate between archaeological sites separated by thousands of miles. The implications of this new dating method means archaeologists can now correlate sites across Africa and perhaps the world in a much shorter time frame than we've had previously. The climactic effects of the eruption appear to have produced a longer dry season, causing people in the area to turn to relying on even more fish in their diet than before. This early and rare evidence of intensive riverine-based foraging was aided by the likely adoption of the bow and arrow, which was seen in the archaeological record by the discovery of projectile points at the site. The volcanic winter and shrinking of the water holes caused by the eruption has led some people to think that this may have pushed humans to migrate outward in search of more food. However, this cutting edge study has added to a growing body of evidence that suggests that the event might not have been so apocalyptic as we thought. Now we head to southeastern Turkey, where the earliest known evidence of body perforation in skeletons, dating back 11,000 years, has been found at the site of Bankuklu Tarla. The discovery has shed new light on the early sedentary community's body modification practices. A team from Ankara University unearthed more than 100 ornaments buried in graves of individuals during the excavations carried out between 2012 and 2017. The ornaments were discovered in situ next to the ears and chins of skeletons and are mostly made from limestone, obsidian, chlorite, copper, or river pebbles. The variety of the ornaments suggests that they were designed for use in both ear and lower lip piercings. This is corroborated by a skeletal analysis of the remains, which shows wear patterns on the lower incisors that match examples of labret wear seen in both historic and modern cultures. 
both males and females had these piercings and perforations, but they were only worn by adults. None of the child burials at the site contained any evidence of these ornaments. The researchers think that this indicates the piercings might have been part of a ritual associated with coming of age. The team hoped to learn more about the choices made regarding raw materials and the connections between general ornamentation activities and traditions of corporal ornamentation as they continue their excavations at the site. This discovery provides the earliest contextual evidence for the use of body augmentation requiring perforation of tissue in Southwest Asia. It challenges existing narratives that place initial engagement with body perforation practices around the middle of the 7th millennium BCE. Our next discovery is also in Turkey and comes from the Çatalhöyük Neolithic settlement site. There, archaeologists have discovered 8,600-year-old remains of bread. You may have heard of this site before as it is one of the first human proto-cities to have ever been built and that we've found so far. Excavations there have been going on for decades. It has now been announced that the project works have discovered an oven structure in the area called Meccan 66. Around the largely destroyed oven were the remains of wheat, barley, pea seeds, and within it was a small and round spongy artifact in the corner. Analysis determined that the spongy residue was fermented bread from 6600 BCE. Interestingly, it had not been baked, but instead had fermented, which had preserved the starches. It was covered with a thin clay that allowed these organic remains to be preserved for us to find later. This find has led the research team to claim that it is now the earliest known evidence of bread, predating other examples that come from Egypt. Our next discovery brings us to the El Cano Archaeological Park in Panama. It contains several pre-Columbian burial grounds and tombs that date to between 700 and 1000 CE. A lot of mystery still surrounds the ancient population that was buried here, but the artifacts found so far are evidence of a rich system of iconography, sophisticated goldworking technology, and an elaborate hierarchy. In 2024, the team there uncovered their most lavish burial yet, and I'm very happy to feature an interview with the team's physical anthropologist, Alexa Hancock, who is here to tell us more about this discovery. Welcome so much to Inside Archaeology and Archaeology News, Alexa. It's a pleasure to have you here to speak to us today. Can you first start off, please, by giving us a brief introduction into the El Cano site? Hey, El Cano has been known since roughly 1927, when it was found by an American archaeologist by the name of Hyatt Barrow. Obviously, locals were aware of it prior to that. Not much work was done, though, in the, in the site until the 50s. I mean, Hyatt Barrow did take some of the sculptures that he found at the time back to the Hyatt Museum. And then in the 50s, some more archaeologists did do some, some work there. But really, uh, El Caño became recognized and known by everybody in 1973 when... Um, the owners of the land were preparing it for, for planting because it's a rural farming area and un, unearthed several funerary urns with burials inside of them. And they stopped what they were doing, called uh, the Ministry of Culture to come out and assess the situation and do basically a rescue excavation. And at that time, they preserved it, eight hectares of the land as what is now known as the El Caño Archaeological Park and Museum. And that's been in place since 1979. How did the foundation that you work for get started? Dr. Julia Mayo is a Panamanian archaeologist who was doing her doctoral research. And um, she did a comparison research with another very well-known site that is approximately two kilometers up river from El Caño. They both sit on the on the banks of the Rio Grande in the Cocle province of Panama. And Sitio Conte was completely excavated in the 30s by Samuel Lathrop, and everything was removed and, and taken to the United States and other countries at that time. And so when you hear about Panamanian gold being exhibited in other museums, it's the gold from Sitio Conte. Well, she started seeing 
too many similarities between Situ Conte and El Caño. The theory at the time was El Caño was the ritual ceremony site for Situ Conte. Both had basalt columns, causeways, rich tombs. So she said it, she felt that there was two separate necropolises there. And she got funding to do some ground surveys based on what she found at that time in 2005 and, and the surveys she did in surrounding areas. She got more funding, a grant to do ground penetrating radar and, and more surveys. And in 2008, started excavating and has been there ever since. Next up is our the discovery that we're, we're featuring this month. So can you tell us more about what you found um, in this particular season? We were working on tomb nine this season. Every tomb has had a high status person in it. They were starting to see a pattern of how the tombs would be. They were all multiple simultaneous burials with a primary person buried in the center of the tomb on the bottom level. Most of the tombs were two, if not three levels deep. When we started on Tomb 9, actually in 2022, we weren't really sure what we were going to find. When we started, we we found it almost by accident because we were working on Tomb 3. And uh, back at that time, the, the tombs were dug not in order. So they're, they're on top of each other and crisscross. So they would cut into a, an existing tomb when they built the new one. So in 2022, we thought it was a piece of a tomb that got cut in and the decision was made, okay, let's take tomb nine out so then we can get a clear excavation of tomb three. Well, as we dug, we realized it was a full tomb and continued digging in 23 and this season. And this season is when we discovered our primary burial who we have dubbed the Lord of the Flutes. Now, why do we call him the Lord of the Flutes, you might ask? Yeah, I thought that was going to be my (laughs) question. What's exciting about the Lord of the Flutes is, unlike the other tombs, the primary burial had no weapons of war with him. Okay. This individual is currently the richest individual we have discovered to date. He had, uh, at the end of the day, eight gold breastplates of different sizes and and designs, six gold arm cuffs on, two belts of gold made of gold beads, large gold beads, roughly about a big, other decorative, very small gold beads, necklaces of small dog teeth, I mean, thousands of dog teeth, and two interesting gold figurines, roughly the size of my palm, one of a man, one of a woman. Now, the, the primary person is always buried face down. It's, and the idea, based on what we know, what was written by the Spaniards, is that is because the primary person is going to be looking to see ahead for his people because they're, they're all there to go to the beyond. What's interesting is that directly underneath him is a woman. We have found women. But to be buried one on top of the other like that is giving me the theory as the physical anthropologist that there's a direct link between them. What it is, we don't know yet. But we found a minimum so far three, if not more, flutes made of animal long bones. Hmm. So the fact that this individual had so many rich grave goods with him, no weapons of war, musical instruments there were also gold bells and the the spaniards wrote they witnessed some of these rituals when they came to to panama and described the funeral ritual include that included musicians included a shaman or a priest the the family members and household members that would be sacrificed with the high health high status person to go accompanying them they went willingly we now need to really look at the iconography on all the breastplates to see if that will help us narrow down or focus or support our theory that this was a a, an individual in a religious role the iconography of the breastplates are matching iconography that we have found in other tombs 
but the iconography in the other tombs was rather singular. It, they all had the same thing. So we had the theory, well, maybe that was kind of their symbol for their clan or their tribe. Well, in this tomb, we are finding all of the iconography represented that we have found in the other tombs, one in each tomb. But that meant like in one tomb, there was like the crocodiles were on the breastplates in another tomb. Bats said in this tomb, we've got them all. So what implication might what that might have for the for the wider site or what you think this person might mean? The implication is one, it shows we still have a lot to learn from El Caño. After doing now nine tunes, you start thinking, oh, it's kind of we're 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 getting repetitive here. We we're understanding a, a structure, a pattern of the tomb. So what we're finding is supporting what we read in the Spanish accounts. And then, oh, here we find a new thing, not a warrior chief. Prior to now, tomb two was the richest, and he was very clearly a warrior chief. The other thing from that I got very excited to find was this individual shows signs of having dental work done, where cavities were filled with uh, something that we need to to do an analysis of to, to confirm what it is. Mm -hmm. But in all the tombs, and I've done a study on all the teeth that we have retrieved from the different tombs, and I've not seen this in any other tomb. That just leads us right into um, our next question, which is what happens next at the site? There will be further excavations, but exactly where uh, is yet to be determined. And I say that because everything we have read and th other things we have found indicate that when they came to El Caño, the people stayed there for a long time. This was not a one or two day ritual. All of the artifacts and grave goods appear to have been made specifically for burial. There's no sign that they were used. So we believe that they set up shop, both literally to make the, the artifacts as well as to live in. We did a uh, mini excavation three or four seasons ago where we did find one uh, post holes in a circular shape indicating one structure at least. So one idea is to continue looking for further structures and see if we can find where these different artifacts were manufactured. So that's, that's one direction we may go to. But in light of what we have found this season, well, one, we have to finish to nine because we ran out of time to actually completely take out all of the burials that are there. I mean, the grave goods are, are excavated, but the remains are still there. So I'll have to take care of that next season. And then we will decide, do we do another tomb or go back to the tomb three we were doing in 2022 or continue looking for the other structures? Then, of course, in the meantime, we can only excavate in dry season. We're going into our rainy season. So during rainy season, we do the analysis of all the artifacts, prepare publications. We already have two conferences on the calendar where, where we will be presenting it. So it, it's going to be a busy rainy season for us. That's great. I'm sure that's exactly what you want. What kind of analysis might you be able to do on the bones or are you hoping to do on the bones to tell you more about this person? Unfortunately. I have yet to find anything that's worth sending for trying to get DNA out of. We have tried multiple times uh, to do DNA and extraction with no luck. The soil is very acidic and the park floods several times during the year. So you have the dry, wet, dry, wet problem of bones. So they are very brittle and crumple when they're excavated. We do radiocarbon dating which so far it's coming back to approximately 750 AD date for the top levels. We don't have the date confirmed for the third level yet. We don't have that result back. I will look at the teeth and see maybe something there will help us. But uh, as of right now, it's he's a male between age 30 and 40. On a, just a different side note, one of the things I noticed last year, a lot of there was a few papers posted on dental enamel peptides. Have you looked into doing that at all? We are going to look at that, especially yeah. now, now that we've seen what we've seen with this, the teeth coming out from, from our man, male and female out of the bottom level. Yep. Mm -hmm. That yeah. would be good. Sounds like you have some exciting stuff to come. 
how can people yes. support you guys and follow what you're doing in the project? Well, we, we have a presence on all the social media sites, Twitter, Instagram, I'm sorry, now X, Instagram and Facebook. We also have a YouTube channel where we upload videos. We are a non-for-profit foundation. Our funding comes from the government and private donations. So we do have a site that we will, it's called globalgiving.org, which people who would like to support our work can donate to. And the donors receive newsletters on a quarterly basis with updates of what we're doing. We appreciate the, any likes on the social media and any any kind of support we receive. Well, it sounds like it, it's definitely a project worth supporting. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, all right. Well, that's that's all that I have for today. Thank you for taking the time to speak to me and my viewers. My pleasure. Wow. What exciting stuff. I am so jealous that Alexa gets to work on a project like that. Don't forget to follow the El Cano project for future updates and info. Their socials and website are linked in the video description. Now we head to China, where archaeologists from the Shanxi Provincial Institute of Archaeology and the Jinzhou Municipal Institute of Cultural Relics have uncovered an intact monumental tomb dating to the Ming Dynasty that ruled China from 1368 to 1644. The discovery was made during excavations of 66 tombs from the Han, Tang, Jin, Yuan, Ming, and Qing dynasties in the Jinfu district. As I said, this tomb dates to the Ming Dynasty. Outside, an ornately carved portal surrounds the tomb's doorway and imitates a wooden gate tower. Inside is a main burial chamber, an antechamber, and several passageways and niches. A 17-meter-long corridor connects to the main burial chamber, which contained two coffins, wooden furniture, and preserved funerary offerings. One of the coffins is decorated with side panels depicting images of peacocks, trees, and floral designs. The other coffin has a diamond-shaped pattern and an inscription. Niches within the tomb contain porcelain jars and vases, while the antechamber contains wooden altars, tables and chairs, incense burners, wooden figurines, and various everyday items such as writing brushes, utensils, and dishes. An epitaph with a seal script provides a possible name for the interred that reads, Epitaph of the Prince of Ming, Ru Huan. Our penultimate find for March is from London, England. A new archaeological analysis of a medieval horse cemetery discovered nearly 30 years ago has revealed the international scale of the horse trade by the elite of Tudor England. 70 whole or partial horse remains were found at the site, which is located outside the walls of the ancient city of London, but was close to the Royal Palace Complex at Westminster, where jousting and stables were known to have been present. The remains include three of the tallest animals known from late medieval England. In the first experiment of its kind on medieval horse remains, the researchers took 22 molar teeth from 15 individual animals and drilled out portions of the animal for isotope analysis to determine the potential origin of each horse. They found that at least half had diverse international origins, consisting with the breeding patterns of royal stud farms. Physical analysis of the teeth revealed wear suggestive of heavy use of a curb bit, especially those groomed for war and tournaments after the 14th century. An analysis of the skeletons revealed many of them to be well above average size for that time, with several instances of fused lower thoracic and lumbar vertebra, which is indicative of a life of riding and hard work. Previously, it was assumed based on written historical records that the English nobility spent fortunes on the animals, including importing them from far away, similar to how wealthy people in modern day acquire expensive supercars. However, the archaeological record offered little corroboration of this because horse remains from the medieval period are rarely found. The new analysis provides a tangible archaeological signature of this trade, emphasizing its historical scale. Our last discovery for today is from Belgium, where part of a London Northeastern Railway, LNER for short, train carriage thought to be almost 100 years old has been found in Antwerp. The carriage appears to have been a wooden removal truck used to transport people's belongings when they moved house. LNER began operations in 1923, running trains along the UK's East Coast railway line. How one of its carriages came to be buried in a field in Antwerp remains a mystery, 
Unfortunately, there was also very little of it left after it was discovered as it had disintegrated while being excavated. That's it for our top discoveries. Which one was your favorite? Let me know in the comments. If you enjoyed this segment, don't forget to like the video. Now we move on to current news and events. Our first story is rather uplifting. You may recall the story from September 2023 of the Sycamore Gap tree at Hadrian's Wall being mysteriously cut down overnight in an act of vandalism. Unfortunately, no one has been charged with this crime against heritage, but this month, the National Trust has announced that seedlings have begun to sprout from genetic material of the tree that was recovered from the site. The seedlings are being grown in a top-secret greenhouse at an undisclosed location that guards genetic copies of some of the UK's most valuable plants and trees. Its Hall of Fame includes copies of the apple tree that Sir Isaac Newton said inspired his theories on gravity, and a 2,500-year-old yew tree that witnessed King Henry VIII's relationship with Anne Boleyn in the 1530s. These backup plants ensure the nation's arboreal and botanical heritage in case of an outbreak of disease, a devastating storm, or an attack on the trees like what happened. Five months on from the felling of the original Sycamore Gap tree, the greenhouse is now looking after nine surviving grafted plants and 40 to 50 seedlings. It will be three more years before horticulturists know if the stump is healthy enough to produce the next tree. The National Trust is still deciding what to do with the seedlings once they are strong enough. If the stump of the felled tree does not regrow, one of these might replace it. But for now, the priority is nurturing the tiny shoots. I hope you'll join me in keeping your fingers crossed that we might eventually see another tree rise up from the ground in the iconic landscape of Hadrian's Wall. Our second news story is a bit more concerning, as researchers have for the first time discovered evidence of microplastic contamination in archaeological soil samples. This pilot project looking at archaeological sediment samples taken from excavations in the center of the historic city of York in the late 1980s has found that they are contaminated by a variety of microplastic polymers. The researchers found that the contamination is occurring almost imperceptibly and has been occurring over many years, seemingly through a diverse range of processes that relate to environmental change, environmental pollution, human behaviors, and infrastructure. This is perhaps not surprising given the extent to which plastic pollution has been increasingly impacting the environment since the Second World War when plastics entered everyday usage and single-use plastics became commonplace. Where this becomes a concern for archaeology is how microplastics may compromise the scientific value of archaeological deposits, as the presence of microplastics can and will change the chemistry of the soil, potentially introducing elements which will cause the organic remains to decay. If that is the case, preserving archaeology in situ may no longer be an appropriate action. The research has concluded that further work needs to be done into this topic and should be a priority for archaeologists, given the potential impact of these man-made chemicals on archaeological material. That's the end of current news and events. We'll close our program today talking about archaeology and entertainment and pop culture. We have just one story this month. On March 21st, an Indiana Jones signature bullwhip sold at auction for over a half a million dollars. The item was the highlight of a Planet Hollywood prop auction and was yielded by Harrison Ford's iconic character in 1984's Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. The whip is now the franchise's most valuable costume or prop. The previous record was $500,000 for a fedora from Raiders of the Lost Ark. Also featured in the auction was one of the several Holy Grail props from The Last Crusade, which, as far as I could find, apparently sold for $87.50. Man, if I'd known about this, I totally would have bought that. <laughs> All right, everyone, time to pack up our finds and hang up our shovels for today. That's everything for the March 2024 edition of Archaeology News. Did you like this video? Is there anything important that I missed? Don't forget to comment, like the video, or subscribe to the channel before you leave. If you're feeling extra generous, you can give me a super thanks or go to my Ko-fi page and support me with a small donation. If you're looking for a more tangible return than my eternal gratitude, then have a look at my Redbubble shop and get a sticker, t-shirt, hat, or mug with your favorite archaeology slogan. 
Taking a few seconds to support me in any way you can helps to grow the channel and promotes quality heritage content that is well-sourced, researched, and is presented by someone who actually has worked in, studied, and researched in this subject. It shows the algorithm that people are interested in real archaeology. Thank you so much for watching. Stay curious, and I hope to see you on my next adventure into the world of archaeology.